Mike here. Um, I want to debut the uh, gravity flooded evaporator for a refrigeration system. Uh, I've been interested in these things for years and uh, I just built one. Started last evening after work and uh, got back into it today about 11 o'clock. It's about 8.30 right now and uh, it's damn well, damn well finished. <clears throat> so I'm not going to talk too much about the brazing process, um, mostly because uh, I'm not very good at it, and uh, fortunately it's all covered up by this good insulation here, so you don't have to look at it. Uh, but I am getting better, and actually in the process of brazing this together, I, I, uh, I, I, I did improve, I think. Um, but the important part is that um, it holds pressure. I held about 260 pounds per square inch for, I don't know, 15 minutes or something, and uh, I bubble checked soap bubbles on every joint to look for uh, any leaks, and it seems to be, uh, seems to be good, so um, that, was, that was a nice, nice finish to it, because I was really nervous. So, let me try to explain what you have, or what you're looking at here. Um, the central column you see here behind the insulation is one inch copper pipe. Uh, there's a one inch cap on the very bottom of that pipe. There's a one inch cap on the very top. Um, of course you can see these four coils extend out from the pipe. They uh, are brazed in down here. They are brazed in up here. Um, everything you see is a common volume. And uh, there is one exception, but uh, I will go into that here in a minute. Now mostly what I want to do here is explain what a gravity flooded evaporator is. Now if you watched any of my previous videos, I uh, had a very crude evaporator that was just about 20 feet of uh, this 3 8 inch copper tubing uh, coiled into a uh, about an 8 inch diameter coil sitting in a metal bucket over here on my refrigeration test bench. Um, it was really crude, it worked, um, but uh, uh, what I really want, what I always dreamed about, was a gravity flooded system. So, um, as I said, uh, these coils, these are the actual evaporator portion of the uh, the unit. Um, the whole thing, I wouldn't call it an evaporator, I'd call it an ebulator, because uh, what happens in this system, this, this device here, is uh, ebullition, boiling, uh, refrigerant boiling, to be specific. Um, and in my case, it's propane. Now, the advantage of a gravity flooded system is uh, uh, the entire inner surface of the evaporator coils are wet at all times, um, more or less. I, I'll go into that here in a minute. Um, so you have greater heat uh, transfer. Um, you're going through the entire phase change of the, uh, the refrigerant rather than uh, flashing off a portion of it just to lower the temperature and then... Uh, uh, absorbing heat throughout the remainder of that phase transition. Um, whenever this thing is up and running, uh, refrigerant will come up and will settle at this level right here. You see there's a sight glass here. This is actually a uh, moisture indicator liquid line uh, sight glass for the high side and uh, I'm utilizing it as a uh, sight glass to, um, to measure the level of refrigerant in here. Now um, Whenever this thing is operating, refrigerant will be filled up to this height here in the central column. And what the central column essentially does is it is a separator. Um, right here, this line coming off is a 3 8 line. Um, ignore this little bit here. This is just some hardware so I could seal it for a pressure test. Um, this runs back to the, uh, the compressor. This is the suction line. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> Now, uh, whenever this thing is filled full of uh, liquid, the suction line is drawing vapor off the top, which lowers the vapor pressure, um, excuse me, it lowers the static pressure, and the vapor pressure of the liquid refrigerant in here uh, allows it to begin to, uh, to boil. When that occurs, liquid is maintained in one of these top coils here. Um, heat is absorbed. In this case, uh, I'm going to use some... Uh, water bottles or something similar to that. Uh, there'll be some insulation on the outside of the coils. Probably some reflective foil and some uh, some uh, uh, hardboard, <clears throat> like one and a half inch or something. Uh, uh, 
polycyanurate or something. Um, whenever that occurs, uh, these uh, the liquid that rests inside of these coils will begin to uh, uh, absorb heat through the copper, and uh, the copper will in turn absorb the heat uh, emitted by the uh, by the bottles. And uh, the boiling that occurs <clears throat> because of this will cause uh, vapor bubbles to form in the uh, in the pr propane. Exactly the same as you would you would witness water boiling in a pot, um, and uh, those vapor bubbles are going to tend to migrate up the coil, and go out into the central column, the separator, which is maintained uh, the liquid liquid level is maintained above that line there. So any vapor that comes out of that line will immediately be drawn up and out through the suction line. Uh, if, by chance, and I'm actually counting on this, that enough violent boiling ebullition occurs, uh, liquid will be carried up through these coils and will actually spit out through these lines and the liquid will fall to the uh, liquid line here and the vapor will be separated and go on up out to the compressor. Um, the advantage to all this is uh, the fact that a uh, uh, the very highest uh, low side pressure can be maintained and at all times um, assuming that the suction line is well insulated uh, only saturated vapor is returning to the compressor very little to no superheat um, these units were used for a long time in uh, the 1920s and the 1930s in domestic refrigerators today they're only used in large commercial applications. Now, I'm interested in going back and uh, uh, reviewing the, uh, the advantages to these. Now, when I first started this, uh, this system, the, the idea of this system, um, this unit you see in front of you, it's gone through many, many iterations. Um, my intention was uh, to make sure that uh, there was enough pitch in these lines. And if you ever look at some old uh, refrigerator evaporators, the uh, low side gravity float type, you'll notice that uh, generally they use uh, just straight pipes that run up and down. There would be a, a horizontal uh, uh, separator that maintained with a float inside the liquid and there'll be U-tubes that drop down and come back up. And um, I, I, as I understand it, I believe that the reason that was done was to ensure that uh, any bubbles that are actually formed in these coils would immediately escape and run up to the uh, to the uh, the header. And um, the best reason I could explain that is because if you have bubble formation in here, that's separating, that's an insulative layer between the liquid inside the coil and the copper. And uh, you don't want any insulation in there, you want good heat transfer. And besides, once those vapor uh, bubbles are formed, they're not doing any good in the evaporator coils. So they need to get out, go back to the compressor. Um, and I was a little apprehensive about using such a low pitch coil. I was worried about uh, bubbles actually being trapped in there and uh, kind of uh, blocking things up. But my intention with this is actually to create a, a thermosiphon effect, as I explained before, um, with uh, a high enough compressor speed and a uh, uh, high enough mass flow, the bubbles that are actually formed are going to uh, uh, carry liquid up through and uh, back to the separator. And, uh, and that's exactly what the separator is supposed to do. Now, another advantage of the separator is um, whenever the, uh, the high side liquid, uh, uh, high pressure uh, saturated liquid, hopefully subcooled a bit, uh, enters into the separator, uh, the flash gas that's formed in order to lower the temperature of the liquid refrigerant uh, down to uh, uh, the, uh, the temperature associated with the pressure that is maintained by the compressor, as far as suction goes, um, there's a little bit of flash gas always formed. Um, and that gas in a normal evaporator, assuming this was just the only evaporator and you had uh, uh, an expansion valve at the base of it here, and, uh, and the liquid and gas combination would have to circulate throughout the entire coil. Well, there's really no need for that gas to be in the coil. It might as well just go, like I said, back to the compressor. Um, so the advantage to this, this system here is that by maintaining this uh, liquid level inside the separator, uh, you can, uh, once you inject that 
that gas liquid combination, that flash gas, gets sent right back to the compressor immediately, leave, leaving the entire surface area uh, inside the evaporator coils themselves to be devoted to uh, to uh, the refrigerating effect, which is what you're looking for. So um, this this column in the center, I call it a separator. Uh, I think that explains it fairly well. Um, but uh, you might also call it an accumulator, you could call it a low side receiver, whatever it is, it, it serves the, the same purpose. So, I explained the, the uh, plumbing on the, uh, the coils. See the sight glass just simply has a line that goes up to the, uh, the, the vapor space on the top of the separator and a line that goes back to the, uh, the liquid in the bottom of the separator. These lines are actually angled slightly. I did that purposely. Um, to ensure that any bubbles that actually get into those lines or form in those lines, um, you see it's relatively well insulated, uh, are able to get out and don't are trapped. So I get a, a good, uh, accurate reading on the, the actual liquid level inside. Now, what makes this thing a little complicated? First, the very obvious thing: there's a low pressure gauge, and that's just uh, goes right through the cap at the top of the one-inch tube. Um, the the kind of a little bit complicated thing about about this particular design is rather than bring the high side in, you see right here, directly into through the expansion valve, throttling valve, um, right into say the vapor space in the top. I chose not to do that, and I also chose not to take it directly into the liquid space uh, below. Um, I could have done that. I could have uh, could have done either one of them really. Um, the main reason I didn't take it into the vapor space is uh, I, especially towards the top, is I would worry about a little bit of that liquid being sucked directly back to the compressor, which is uh, could cause liquid slugging, and it's taking away from the refrigerative effect. Uh, anyway, I didn't choose to take it directly into the liquid portion, um, which would, I think, be a better option. Uh, the flash gas would bubble to the surface. Um, instead, this line actually travels into the side of the separator, goes down through the separator, comes out the bottom, loops back, and here you see a small quarter inch needle valve. That's my uh, my throttling valve right there. From there, it's now low, uh, low pressure liquid and some flash gas. It goes directly into the side of the uh, the one inch tube separator, um, discharging its low pressure liquid gas combination uh, into the separator. Now, the reason I did that, it's not, it's not really going to necessarily gain anything. It might not work very well at all. What I'm doing is I'm subcooling that high pressure liquid. Now, I don't get that for free because the same, probably the same amount of gas would be produced by just injecting it right after the expansion valve, excuse me, throttling valve, right into the separator. There's a certain amount of, of gas produced, maybe 10 or 15 percent um, of the, uh, the total amount of liquid produced just gets, gets uh, evaporated off as flash gas and sent back to the, uh, the compressor. Um, what I do by this, by sending it through the separator first, there's uh, you know eight or ten inches of quarter inch tubing that will be uh, immersed in uh, quite cold, low pressure liquid, and uh, it will that liquid is going to absorb some heat through that the wall of that quarter inch tubing, uh, which is going to cause it to uh, to evaporate, uh, form bubbles, and so rise to the surface and go back to the uh, the uh, the compressor. What's left is a slightly lower temperature. Uh, hopefully uh, subcooled to the evaporator temperature, not likely because there's not a lot of surface area for that heat transmission to occur. Um, and whenever it loops back and goes into the expansion valve, hopefully uh, a uh, completely saturated liquid comes out the other side with no flash gas. Now the reason I'm doing that is because um, I'm curious to know how much more easily it's going to be to control the throttling valve without the flash gas and having a combination of gas and liquid traveling through that orifice. Um, it might not help me at all. Um, it might not improve the COP at all. Um, but nonetheless, I'm curious. And with this whole device here, I've skipped about 
27 steps on my way to uh, building a better evaporator, at least for my purposes. Um, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, I don't think it's going to hurt anything. I don't see how it could possibly hurt anything. But um, you can see here there's a line for a uh, thermocouple. Uh, and there's one actually placed about right down here. Didn't want to get too close to the throttling valve because I didn't. I wanted a, a decent reading on how much subcooling there was um, after the heat exchanger inside the separator. Um, if I got it too close to the expansion valve, it might read a little bit colder than it might actually be, just because of the uh, heat conduction through the copper and brass. Um, and then uh, additionally, there's another thermocouple up here. And this is the um, hopefully subcooled high pressure liquid that's being injected through the line before the heat exchanger. So the difference between those two values should be give me a rough idea how much additional subcooling that I'm doing. Um, the overall design of this, having four evaporator coils, and I'll just say that again, this is the separator. The whole thing isn't an evaporator, the whole thing is the ebulator, as I... Uh, as I dub it, um, but the evaporator coils themselves, there's four of them and in this configuration because I want to use these, uh, these, these water bottles um, and because my ultimate intention is to uh, make this entire apparatus uh, pedal powered and I think it's within so somewhere within reason to do at least one pound of water, it's about a pound, and uh, my goal is to do, you know, two, three, four, and maybe more. We'll see. But um, four seems like it could be um, possible. So I gave myself the option to do four. Um, I may actually insulate the whole thing inside of one big box. Um, I may insulate each uh, evaporator coil individually and then insulate it in one big box. Um, I do con am a little bit concerned about frost formation insulating the coils, which may lead me to put it inside of a large insulated box and then um, put some, some kind of desiccant in there to keep things dry um, and possibly purge it with dry nitrogen. So uh, anyway, that's about you know 12 hours of work right there. And uh, I got to say I'm pretty pleased with it. It's kind of neat. Never seen anything like it before, never seen a DIY flooded evaporator and I've certainly never seen a, um, a flooded evaporator really at all other than in pictures. They're just, um, they're just not commonly used anymore except for 100 ton plus systems. So hey if you watched this whole video good for you for listening through all my uh, boring dialogue but I'm excited about it. The ebulator.